Kolko's Sovko's agriculture affords every opportunity for the unlimited development of materialist biological science, of Michurin's teaching, creative Darwinism. So Michurin was a Russian agronomist who wasn't a Marxist, by the way. So Lysenko is not simply coming from the perspective of Marxist dialectical materialism. And this is something a lot of people get wrong. Lysenko didn't begin as an ideologist. He began as a faithful Michurinist, Michur, Michurinian, whatever how you call that. And Michurin, is, uh, according to Lysenko and others, reflected an authentically Russian science. Not simply Marxist, not simply dialectical materialist, but authentically Russian science. Again, Marxism does not create its own metaphysics. Marxism allows one to appreciate a repressed metaphysical kernel of civilizations annihilated by Anglo-Saxon modernity. So in China, they have their own Chinese metaphysics and so on and so on, and their own Chinese uh, science and tradition, which Marxism opens up. I.V. Michurin wrote, we have as yet no correct exhaustive conception of how nature has created and still incessantly creates innumerable species of plants. At the present time, it is of much greater benefit to us to realize that we have entered that stage of our historical development in which we are able personally to intervene in the actions of nature and in the first place can considerably accelerate and numerically increase the form of building new species. And in the second place, artificially divert the building of their qualities in a direction more advantageous to man. Form building is what he's calling it. They're calling it form building of new species. And in the second place, artificially divert the building of their qualities in a direction more advantageous to man. We must furthermore appreciate the fact that such work jointly performed by us and nature represents progress of the highest order of global significance. This will become evident to all from the results which the development of this undertaking will bring in the future. An undertaking powerfully impulsed by the revolution that aroused millions of creative minds in the land of, of Soviets. From here, a considerable portion of the population has been given the opportunity to improve life round about by deliberate action. Michurin's teaching, creative Darwinism, does not regard development as continuous evolution, but as the genesis of a new quality within the old, of a quality that contradicts the old, which undergoes a gradual quantitative accumulation of its peculiar features, and in the process of its struggle against the old quality, constitutes itself into a new, fundamentally different totality of properties with its own distinct law of existence. Dialectical materialism, developed and elevated to a new high plane by the works of Comrade Stalin, is the most valuable, most potent theoretical weapon in the hands of Soviet biologists. Michurinists and this weapon they must use in solving the profound problems of biology, including the problem of a descent of one species from another. So, liberal, Western liberals are going to tell you, Lysenko created problems. He thought that biology was incompatible with Marxism, so he changed biology so it would be compatible with Marxism. But Lysenko was addressing real problems of biology itself. And he thought Marxism helped you understand and clarify those. In agricultural practice, as well as in nature, relative but quite definite boundaries between species have always existed. By relative but quite definite specific boundaries, we mean that parallel with similarity between species there has always exists specific distinctness, which divides organic nature into qualitatively distinguishable yet interlocking links or species. No continuous, unbroken series of form. Look, this is the problem with Anglo-Saxon metaphysics. There is no dialectic of qualitative form. Anglo-Saxon metaphysics reduces all of being to different expressions of the same essence, same thing. It imposes a specific foreclosure and repression of being upon all of history and all of reality. This is why Anglo-Saxon thinking is so reductive. This is why they think imperialism existed a thousand years ago. It's what Anglos called the pathology of nothing new under the sun. 
No continuous, unbroken series of forms between species. Different, qualitatively definite states of living matter can be found. This is so not because of the intermediate forms in a continuous range have all died out as a result of mutual competition, but because there is no such continuity in nature, nor can there be. Unbroken continuity does not exist in nature. Continuity and discontinuity always form a unity. A species is a distinct, qualitatively definite state of living matter, definite intraspecific interrelations between individuals are an essential characteristic of each species of plant, animal, and microorganism. Let me repeat that. Definite intraspecific interrelations between individuals are an essential characteristic of each species of plant, animal, and microorganism. It almost kind of reminds me of like Mula Sadra's existentialistic kind of philosophy. It's the existence which is the ground for distinct type of essence here. There is a qualitatively different existence here. These intraspecific interrelations differ qualitatively from the interrelations between individuals of different species. Therefore, the qualitative difference between intraspecific and interspecific interrelations is one of the most important criteria for distinguishing between species and variety. So, the interrelations within a species are qualitatively distinct from the relations between individuals of different species. This is one of the criteria that establish what a species is. It is wrong to state that a variety is an incipient species and that a species is sharply defined variety. For this erroneous formulation were taken as the starting point, it would follow that there is no qualitative difference, no line between species and varieties, and that the species is not a reality existing in nature, but something contrived for convenience of classification, for systemics. Here, and of this mention has been made above, lies one of the basic contradictions between the theory of continuous evolutionism and the realities of the organic world. Varieties intermediate between species, varieties intermediate between species do not exist, not because these varieties dropped out in the process of an intraspecific struggle, but because they never did and do not now arise in free nature. Varieties are forms of existence of a given species and not steps in its transformation into another species. The profusion of varieties is the result of many-sided ecological adaptivity of the species concerned. It promotes the well-being of the species and tends to preserve it. Now, everyone always credits who is the guy, Stephen Jay Gold, his punctuated equilibrium. Basically, his idea was that his way of explaining the difference, hard distinctions between species, was an idea called punctuated equilibrium, which adds geological change to the mix. For him, a qualitative geological transformation of some kind is what creates speciation. For Stephen Jay Gould, he basically said that the evidence shows speciation cannot be explained by gradual continuous change. Richard Dawkins said, no, that's not true. It happens gradually over a scale of millions and millions of years. Stephen Jay Gould said, no, it happens when there's a qualitative change geologically and say, oh, he got it from Marxism. Probably not. Stephen Jay Gould probably got that idea from Lysenko. The, ge the geological thing is a different uh, story, but Lysenko is giving profound and great emphasis to the need of to recognize qualitative distinct nature of species and organism and different life forms because as we can see in biological reality between species there are no intermediate forms between species the more varieties within a species and the more diversified its intraspecific populations the more certain the species and all the varieties are to thrive 
through the agency of, for instance, cross-pollination. So the more varieties within a species, because it's within a species, and the more diversified its intraspecific populations, the more certain the species and all its varieties are to thrive through the agency of, for instance, cross-pollination. The interrelations between individuals of the same species are, we have said, of a quality different from that of the interrelations between individuals of different species. The term species is therefore fundamentally different in biology from other botanical and zoological terms, such as genus, family, and the like. Basically, Darwin refuses hard distinction between species and variety. Lysenko says no. It can be easily noticed that the interrelations between individuals of different species belonging of the, to the same botanical or zoological genus do not promote the well-being of the species concerned, but, on the contrary, are competitive antagonistic. It is therefore usually too difficult to find in nature or practical agriculture instances of prolonged coexistence in populations of individuals belonging to different but closely related species of the same botanical genus, joint existence of plant species may frequently be observed, but these species are distantly related, belonging to different botanical genera. You see, it's also the same in the animal world. There is a joint existence of different organisms only when they are of different uh, they are distantly related uh, in, in species. Joint existence of species of the same botanical genus is possible, however, only if the members of each species are distributed in beds or hills. Hence, the concept genus in botany and zoology does not imply ordinary ties of kinship such as intraspecific ties, but indicates solely that all the species of any genus have a common origin. Dawkins doesn't deny punctuated equilibrium. Didn't he say that the main thrust of uh, ch organisms change is... Uh, didn't he say that the main thrust of uh, change is, uh, is gradual development, gradual evolution, gradual uh, selective pressure, and so on? The term genus serves to specify morphologically similar but qualitatively distinct species. In spite of their external similarity, the individuals of div different... Remember, guys, I know this is all very simplistic, what Lysenko is saying right now. But you got to understand, this is made for the layman. Lysenko's the barefooted scientist, and he's bringing science to the masses. Kind of like I'm doing for you guys. In spite of their external similarity, the individuals of different species of genus do not cross under the living conditions to which they are habituated or when crossed fail to produce normally fertile offspring. They are physiologically incompatible. Moreover, the interrelations between species of the same genus are competitive, mutually exclusive, as we have already stated. Species are links in the chain of living nature, stages of qualitative distinctness, steps in the gradual historical development of the organic world. Botanical and zoological taxonomy includes a number of so-called doubtful species, these are species of which systematists are unable to say whether the diverse plants or animals concerned form one or two species. But such species are doubtful only because these forms are little known or because biologists have found no scientifically objective criterion by which to distinguish species and therefore substitute for such criterion separate characters tentatively accepted for the various species. Proof of this is the fact that in agricultural practice, people deal with a variety of animals and plants and microorganisms without, doubt ever, without a doubt ever rising in the mind of anyone as to whether a particular group of plants, animals, or microorganisms belongs to one, two, or more species. Hence, doubtful species exist only in systematics, but not in living nature. Species in a state of nature are separated by specific qualitative differences by relative but, quanti but quite definite lines of distinction. These must be found so that specific forms, groups of plants, animals, and microorganisms may be properly delineate delineated, systematized, and classified. Nor is the thesis correct, which maintains that the qualitative specific features of species 
do not for any length of time remain constant. As a matter of fact, species of plants, animals, and microorganisms exist in nature as long as the conditions necessary for the subsistence of their respective individuals endure. The proof is here in the pudding that Lysenko does not deny natural selection. He just said it. Should I repeat the sentence again? As a matter of fact, Species of plants, animals, and microorganisms exist in nature as long as the conditions necessary for their subsistence of their respective individuals endure. So does Lysenko deny natural selection? No! The prime cause of the appearance of species from other species as well as intraspecific diversity of form is change in the conditions of life of plants and animals, change in the type of metabolism. The genesis and development of new species is bound up with such alteration in types of metabolism during the process of development of the various organisms as affect the characteristics features of the species concerned. Okay, back in Lysenko's time. Now, what do we think when we think of the word metabolism? We think the way our body uh, digests and processes food. For Lysenko, during this time, it's in the word metabolism meta meaning above and balism meaning the biological process so here meta metabolism means the higher the higher biological organism as a, as a as a form i know i'm not saying that right sorry the higher higher form of the biological organism this is evidenced by the data obtained during the last few years there's kevin logan hey kevin you're watching this he does it <laughs> He doesn't know a goddamn thing he's talking about. What is he talking about? Dude, suck my dick. This is evidenced by the data up. It's so fucking easy to just repeat what the establishment fucking says. Of course, you're going to sound like a genius if you do that. If you're presenting new ideas or ideas a lot of people aren't familiar with, it's fucking hard, okay? Remember, self-criticism. Ignore the mice. This is evidenced by the data obtained during the last few years of our research on the problem of speciation in the plant kingdom. In 1948, V.I. Carapetian observed in his experiments that if 28 chromosome durum wheat is sown late in the autumn, some of the plants are converted rather quickly, in two or three generations, into another species, into 42 chromosome soft wheat. Okay, this is where like, people say, oh, Lysenko's a quack, this isn't possible. But Lysenko isn't the one who's claiming only to be able to do this. He's saying this guy is. Which means it wasn't only him. He's fraudulent. You know, like, it's happening all over the Soviet Union. And these experiments have not been in good faith properly attempted to be reproduced. On the basis of the genetically qualitative, genetic qualitative heterogeneity of the plant's organism's body, a heterogeneity previously established by Michurinist biology, it was decided to search for grains of soft 42 chromosome wheat in the spikes of experimentally grown durum wheat. As a result, individual grains of soft wheat were quite easily observed in the spikes of durum wheat. Grains of one botanical species were found in the spikes of another species. Isn't this, uh, I'm not a fucking agriculturist. It's called genetic, I think this actually happens. Gene transfer, right? In plants. Are used to trans... Yeah, gene transfer in plants is actually a thing that scientists today admits is real. Maybe that's what they're talking about here? I don't know. When grains of this soft wheat taken from spikes of durum wheat were sown, they produced, as a rule, soft wheat plants. In many districts, a careful search will reveal each year the presence of soft wheat grains in some of the durum wheat spikes arise... Oh, okay, they're talking about something else. A search for rye grains in wheat spikes was insinuated, instituted in the fields of the foothill districts where winter wheat crops are frequently found to be adulterated with, with rye. Until a few years ago, scientists did not know the original cause. Of so, so, what did Western scientists say? They said, Oh, Lysenko simply thought he could turn wheat into rye. No, Lysenko said that wheat... Winter wheat crops are frequently found to be adulterated with rye. Scientists didn't know how to explain it. V.K. 
Karapishian, M. M. Jakubstiner, V. N. Gromachevsky, and a number of other research workers, as well as a number of agronomists and students, found single grains of rye in durum and soft wheat spikes, in the spikes of two wheat species which grew in the fields of various foothill districts. Over 200 such grains of rye were found in 1949. These grains were sown at the Institute of Genetics of the Academy of Sciences in the USSR, in an experimental field of the Lenin Academy of Agricultural Sciences of the USSR at Gorky Leninskaya, uh, uh, Leninskaya, I don't know how to say it, and at the K.F. Timur, Timur's, Timuryezev Agricultural Academy in Moscow. Unthreshed spikes of durum and soft wheat were likewise sent to the Lenin Academy of Agricultural Sciences of the USSR from the districts mentioned. While they were being threshed at different biological research institutions, several persons found some more grains of rye. From these grains of rye, which had developed in spikes of durum and soft wheat, a diversity of plants was grown. These plants, with few exceptions, were nevertheless typical rye. Only in a very few cases were wheat plants obtained from rye-like grains. In all the above cases where grains of one species of plant were found in spikes of neither species, neither the plants themselves nor the thresh spikes showed any signs whatsoever of being intermediate forms. They seemed to be typical, ordinary spikes of durum or soft wheat. But the internal state of these wheat plants was no longer the usual one, was no longer qualitatively homogeneous in respect to the species. This is indicated by the fact that these wheat grains produced not only grains of wheat, but also some few grains of rye, that is, grains of another species. In 1949, the Lenin Academy of Agricultural Sciences of the USSR received samples of oats whose panicles contained single grains of wild oats alongside of the grains of cultivated oats. That is to say, the plants of one species, Avena sativa, brought forth individual grains of another species, A. fatua. Publications abroad as well as in our country have likewise repeatedly referred to cases where wild oats were found in pure line oats. It has been observed year after year when cultivating branched wheat on experimental plots of the Lenin Academy of Agricultural Sciences of the USSR and in another in a number of other localities that admixtures of soft and durum wheat, oats, two and four rolled barley, and also spring rye appear in the crops. How many people are on YouTube right now? Only 94, wow. I guess, okay, in future, no more Lysenko. <laughs> it's just not popular. <laughs> All our observations led us to conclude that the original source of these admixtures was the branched wheat itself. In 1950, it was discovered in several cases that barley plants, which were growing as an admixture and bring... Okay, so the simplification that Lysenko was simply changing one species into another is a big simplification, Okay. In practical farming, it has long been assumed and repeatedly asserted that one kind of agricultural plant can be converted or transformed into another, uh, as for instance wheat into rye. A great controversy was waged in print on this subject in our country as early as the first half of the previous century. So the first half of the 1800s, this was a controversy. Before Marx, before there was any Marxism or dialectical materialism so, uh, at all. Therefore, the conversion of durum wheat into soft or conversion of durum and soft wheat into rye would seem by itself to be nothing new. However, all the new facts we have ad adduced were obtained in a systematic way or as the result of a systematic search. Lysenko never simply turned one species into another. The whole point for him, if you actually read him here, is that rye grains were being found already being found in wheat one in wheat spikes 